I'd like to welcome Dr. Sasha Blaskovich from Langley, BC, who's a board certified chiropractor. And Dr. B, I understand you referred to as Dr. B. Uh, could yes. you start with an introduction as to how you got into this work and your intention to uh, assist afflicted patients? Sure, absolutely. I initially got into being uh, wanting to be a chiropractor because of a hip issue that I had. But then once in uh, when chiro once in chiropractic already, um, I realized that I had sustained an injury playing football in university that uh, was misdiagnosed as a concussion, and because none of the normal treatments, which are not very effective generally, uh, were helping me either, and so uh, that set me down a path of trying to figure out what was wrong with me, and uh, and you know led me to the end point where I discovered that uh, what I've been telling my doctors all along, which is it felt like my head was not connected to my neck, um, was in fact true to an extent. And I discovered uh, something uh, that would be basically termed motion x-ray that was able to assess my neck in the different ranges of motion. So forward, backward, side to side and rotation and be able to visualize in real time the amount of movement between each of the separate vertebrae as they relate to each other, only to find out that my top two vertebrae were beyond excessively moving um, relative to each other. And so that uh, started me down another path of trying to figure out, well, what does that affect inside the body to give me these horrendous symptoms that would, you know, fluctuate and come and go that would take me from being a you know perfectly functional human being to completely bedridden and uh, debilitated and so that kind of brought me to you know fast forward where we are now uh it's a whole world of uh patients like myself in different degrees of, of severity from all over the world um that are displaying very similar symptom patterns of very sim similar um pathologies that are um, dealing with a very similar cascade of, of events and also um, very few physicians and clinicians that are able to recognize this because it is so vague and most people, if not all people, or at least close to all people, look very normal as far as their exterior, but yet their interior function is extremely affected. And it's not always extremely affected, which also makes it another you know difficult case for most physicians because they expect if an, if an arm's cut off, an arm's cut off and it's always going to be cut off so they can always see it versus, you know, sometimes the arm is there, sometimes the arm is not there. And that makes it really difficult. But I would say that, you know, more and more as time goes on, I'm beyond um, surprised that as to how frequent this problem occurs in different degrees of severity in all walks of life, in all areas of the world. Um, it's far more common than I would have ever imagined. Um, yeah, I concur. Actually, that was my findings outside of medicine and meeting individuals in clinics. Uh, I noticed that this was a common problem across many different patient groups, and that's where I developed my particular interests. And I want to say that a well-known not-for-profit that deals with injuries specifically uh, asked me and commented, are there five cases a year? Um, and I said, no, there have to be a whole lot more because I'm meeting people across just Ontario alone. Mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing your story. I think it's very important because we uh, we have been impacted by this significantly. And I think it's uh, we understand what it looks like symptomatology, anatomy wise, but yet visibly, as you say, we look normal. So I think that's a great place to start. Um, so before we get into a discussion of a deep dive of the craniocervical junction, can you introduce the anatomy of the neck and the spine more broadly? And then we can start from C0, the occipital bone, which attaches the point of the head and the base of the skull. And we can talk about why the upper cervical vertebrae or how they're different. Um, sure. And also how they're designed to function and that the alignment is crucial to the integrity and the functional architecture of the spinal cord and the midbrain. Sure. Uh, the vertebrae, so this, the neck or the cervical spine, as it's known, has seven vertebrae, uh, the top two being named the atlas and the axis. And then below that, we have then C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, which resemble each other to some extent. 
uh, whereas C1 and C2 are quite different from each other uh, and quite different from the rest of the cervical spine as to they have no discs. And so the integrity of C1, C2 and the skull as they relate to each other is primarily that of being held together by multiple ligaments that go in all different directions to try to basically stabilize motion in all different directions while maintaining a level of functionality that will allow us to have, you know, mobility to be able to navigate our environment. Um, the, the top two, or the, I guess the, the lower cervical vertebrae, they basically separate from each other by discs. And those discs are basically shock absorbers and allow for some motion. Uh, whereas the top, like I said, the top two vertebrae, they do not have any discs and are just tethered together by ligaments and musculature. And uh, so when you have um, problems there, and, and for example, like you said, the, the, the top area of the cervical spine where C1 and C2 are and also where the skull is, that is the junction point where the last part of our brainstem, which houses the last four cranial nerves, and in my opinion, the, the vagus being the most important of those, which controls most of our background bodily functions, can be affected. And so when you have excessive mobility or excessive motion at that C1, C2 region, that can affect your neurology because ultimately the C1, C2 junction point is intended to protect the brainstem and allow for some mobility. But when there's injuries or different conditions that would erode or somehow degrade those ligaments, you're left with more movement than you should have. And then the structures C1 and C2 whose intent is to protect your brainstem actually become the things that actually irritate the brainstem. Yeah, can you point that out physically? I know you you have your models, you can demonstrate with your model. Sure. And then could you also use, you have you have a good size skull there. I mean, we can use you as a demonstration sure. of the location and where patients may present with certain symptomatology. Yeah, sure. So people generally present with symptomatology, right? Just as soon as you go off the ridge of the back of the skull, down in that upper region and it's sometimes left sometimes right but most of the times they kind of feel it all the way across so all the way across underneath here so this being the skull this being c1 this being c2 and this being c3 and so this is a model that just displays the upper cervical spine as it relates to the skull but it's kind of just this region underneath here that they feel it which is termed the suboccipital region and they can have pain there which will then stem into you know headaches and then whatnot and stiffness um does that make sense? It does. Um, Dr. Fellings, who's a well-known surgeon, neurosurgeon in Ontario, I uh, used a meaningful analogy when he describes the cranial cervical junction, and he describes it as prime real estate. Um, so part of what you alluded to, can you go on to explain what is housed around this special location and why this area being functioning is so critically optimal? Well, yeah, like I said, so the, the prime real estate is basically the interface between the brain and the body um, gets funneled through that section there. So that's kind of the section where you have the cerebellum, which is the body's balance and coordination center that coordinates most of the information coming from the brain that goes, goes down to the body and has to funnel then through the brain stem to get to its end point. And also information coming from the body is coordinated and 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 uh, distributed there to get up to the brain to you know, allow for perception. And so when that region there is somehow affected, it's prime real estate in the sense that if something happens there, it will have the ability to affect the entire body and its uh, different functional systems. And so a prime example of that would be, you know, patients that I see that have or appear to have um, impairments in their digestive system, in their cardiovascular system, in their temperature control system, in their balance and coordination system, in the visual system, in their hearing system. And it's really hard to fathom that a single person can have actual malfunctions on all those different levels with all those different systems at the same time, where it's just that system that is doing something wrong versus all those systems are integrated and controlled by one central location. And from that central location, all the systems are connected to. And so um, when you see that many systems affected all at the same time or, or sporadically in different variations, one has to 
have it cross their mind is, is there a central location that connects to all these different systems that might give us some answers? And, and that's, I think, oftentimes the, the scenario that is not being looked at. So a lot of focus is, you know, put on the cardiovascular system. Is there something wrong with your heart or your respiratory system? Um, is there something wrong with your temperature system? Is your endocrine system okay? Like all these different systems are being assessed as isolated entities, but yet the person is presenting with multiple systems having something going on. And like like I said, rarely is the is the is the is the attention being put on well what controls or what has connections to to all those symptoms, and that would be the brainstem region. Yeah, to your point, uh, medicine has historically operated in silos, and many GPs, as I'm told from my GP, were not taught about this particular area and the importance of the craniocervical junction. Um, so it's fascinating to hear current discussions that are occurring about patients with, for example, POTS dysautonomia and many other things, and they are not necessarily one category of patients. The, yeah. um, we can talk more about causation in the future. Uh, could you speak about persistent alignment and how this results in dysfunction in the neck area and some of the long-term consequences? Some would argue or are of the opinion that instability is not really the case. It's just persistent alignment. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I think that the notion of persistent misalignment, which is, I think, what you're asking, right? Misalignment. Thank you. Yeah, misalignment. So yeah. So persistent misalignment is it's really hard to statically say that somebody has a persistent misalignment in uh, a, a section of the body that is intended to be moving. And it is moving in most every patient that I've seen, unless they've had either surgical fusion or they've somehow through the process of degenerative arthritis had their body fuse that section on its own, there will be motion there. So um, the dynamic nature of that entity would dictate that at any given moment, if a person, for example, is aligned by a practitioner that does aligning and they have a loss of integrity of their ligament structures there, which means that there's nothing passively holding those vertebrae in their aligned position, um, you will be susceptible to a misalignment. And so because of the dynamic nature of, you know, even just sitting there and having gravity pushed down on your head, the joints are not stacked perfectly flat like sheets of plywood, for example. There is some angulation to these joints. So even just the weight of the head with gravity and if the ligaments are not tethering properly because they've been injured or stretched or eroded or chewed away by some inflammatory condition, you have an elongation of those ligaments. So when those vertebrae stack and you're just sitting there behind your computer, because of the angulations of those joints, you could have slippage where your joint actually slips and misaligns just from you sitting there. Not to mention if you're doing you know movements and things like that uh, functionally with your neck, you'll, you'll be susceptible to a misalignment. And the only sort of saving grace that we have to provide a dynamic coordination of uh, C1 that is repeatedly and perpetually misaligning is our muscular system. When the ligaments have been compromised, again, through either injury or inflammatory conditions or something that's erosive, uh, we have our neuromuscular system that can actively get involved and maintain alignment so that this you know persistent misalignment that is being found can, to some extent, be mitigated for some amount of time before the muscles um, are fatigued out and then they potentially themselves will create a misalignment as they go into a sort of a lockdown state to prevent themselves from being further overworked because they can only handle so much. So if the bones are malaligned, this puts extra load on the ligaments, which also results in dysfunction in the musculature. Yeah, correct. The, well, the musculature uh, achieves its dysfunction by being active for too long in a function that it's not intended to do. So the, the, the muscles that are deep inside the back of the neck where I showed you here under the skull, so those are termed as a group, the suboccipital muscles. So they're about layer five or six in the scheme of things. So you go from superficial to deep and they're the deepest layer of muscles that have in general an involuntary basis for their contractility, which means you can't will them to contract. They contract based on sensing changes in position and the direction of the change in position and how fast that happens so the velocities basically they send a signal up to the you know brainstem and the spinal cord in order to coordinate 
correcting that motion. So they sense themselves being stretched into a position that they're not accustomed to. And the natural response due to the whole the sensor system is for them to pull back and get back into neutral, which dick which basically translates to misalignment, realignment, misalignment, realignment. And when they've repeatedly done that, what ends up happening is, and that's a reflex that goes straight into the spinal cord and back to that muscle. When they've repeatedly cycled through that stretch contract, so misalign, realign, misalign, realign phenomenon, you have neural impulses, sensory impulses going up into the central nervous system as well, which then sends a more persistent, as opposed to just a stretch contract response or a reflex, it sends a more persistent signal down to those same muscles, getting them to shorten down in general which is basically an accentuation or an elevation of their resting tension or their resting tone. And if that goes too far, which oftentimes it does, you end up having that muscle then go into a shortened down toned mode where it actually then misaligns. So what was protecting the alignment initially, if overworked, which it always does get overworked, actually causes a misalignment once it tries to protect itself. And so then the goal is to then do something to that muscle to get it to release back again so it can go into that sense mode where it can sense the misalignment and realign, sense the misalignment and realign until, again, the central nervous system gets involved, sends a more constant signal down to that muscle, gets it to shorten down so it protects itself, and then you get into this repeated cycle again. And, and when it's functional, so when this muscle is able to sense the misalignment and realign or this group of muscles, um, it's it can be quite effective as far as a reduction in symptoms and an improvement in functionality. It's just that that active process is not intended to be such. It's all that system is only intended to do minor corrections every now and then versus be the thing that's constantly working to maintain integrity and alignment. And that's where the, you know, the, the loss of the integrity of the ligaments is such a crucial pathology because it puts the body into that other system that doesn't inevitably have a chance or the ability to perpetually maintain that status quo. And so then you get into these fluctuating, you know, flare ups and better flare ups and better because of that system failing. Thank you. That's really helpful. I know some of your therapeutics are focused on self management and uh, we'll talk more about that in the future as well. Uh, what do your patients have in common, which compromises this area and how does this result in the longer term biomechanical issue? Uh, yeah, so the vast majority of patients do present with, uh, you know, post-trauma, whether it's recent post-trauma or uh, past post-trauma that slowly, progressively with additional micro traumas kind of cumulatively results in the, the pathology that we find, which inevitably in most cases is damage to the ligaments resulting in excessive motion. And, and the delineation between, you know, is this hypermobility or is this instability, I would say is dictated by their clinical presentation. So if somebody just has, you know, tightness in their muscles and, uh, and pain in their neck and the occasional headache, I would probably say that I would call, and we do discover that there's excessive motion between C1 and C2 through imaging, I would call that a hypermobility problem. But once it starts getting into autonomic uh, effect or affect, then, for example, they start getting neurological symptoms like blurry vision, you know, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, you know, temperature control issues, balancing coordination issues, uh, speech issues, forgetfulness, irritability, um, heart palpitations. Then I would say we're dealing with instability because it's now causing a pathologic irritation to the nervous system, resulting in a cascade of potential diagnoses that people have been given or are given, such as POTS, dysautonomia, chronic fatigue syndrome, and, and ultimately, um, all those named conditions are truly descriptions of symptom patterns. So there's there's no core um, tissue that is being diagnosed as the pathology in, for example, POTS. POTS just basically tells you that a person has postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, so when they go upright or change in position, their heart races. So it's describing what they're experiencing, but it's not truly telling you what's causing that. And so when you have instability and the instability is more than likely causing the irritation to the brainstem or the vagus nerve, which would then govern what happens with the heart, for example, uh, you have a more specific diagnosis. So for example, upper cervical instability due to ALR ligament uh, damage on the right or left or bilateral resulting in brainstem irritation yielding the presentation of POTS. So that would be, in my opinion, a more appropriate diagnosis because you're listing 
the suspected tissue. In both cases, you can never be 100% certain, but at least when you have a tissue that is showing abnormality and the patient has a, a cluster of symptoms that would be likely to be expected with some kind of irritation in that body region, then you can cluster those together and say cause and effect. So cause being damage to the ligaments, yielding instability and the effect then is what we see as POTS. Thank you. Thank you for tying all that together. It's, uh, I think the understanding has uh, continued to evolve and neurosurgeons are working more actively to communicate, neurologists, uh, different committees and teams are being formed. So I'm hopeful that this work will continue. Um, can you address the terminology, CCI, craniocervical instability, AAI, uh, address each of them in upper cervical instability, which some physiotherapists prefer to use, a talk about them and whether you can use them interchangeably or whether you distinguish them based on the specifics of the location. Sure. Um, I'll start with the upper cervical instability. Um, that basically is a generic term for um, excessive motion somewhere between the skull and I would say C2, C3. So it doesn't really delineate the exact location. Truly the exact location can only be delineated by imaging. Palpation and orthopedic testing or neurologic testing can only give you an indication as to where it might be, whereas imaging can tell you exactly is it between the skull and C1, which we'll call the skull C0, so C0, C1, or from C1, C2, or C2, 3, and further down, and then is it left at, or right or both, and is it anterior, posterior, or both, and so you can determine very precisely where the instability is and the location, so left, right, front, back, or any combination of those. Um, atlantoaxial instability, which I'll jump to that one next, that literally tell, spells out which two vertebrae it's referring to. So atlas and axis, so C1 and C2, will yield atlantoaxial instability. And so you can have a central atlantoaxial instability, which is internal, right inside the spinal canal which involves the alar ligaments, the transverse ligament, the spinal accessory ligaments, or you can have a posterior instability, which would include the atlantoaxial membrane, the posterior atlantoaxial membrane, which is another ligamentous tissue that basically holds the backs of C1 and C2. So in between here, between C1 and C2 inside here, and would minimize the amount of gapping that happens in the back. And the central one is more of a rotational instability. So C1 and C2, so this is C1 and C2, it would be a rotational instability that would be caused by the internal derangement of the ligaments, uh, which more will have more effect on the, the brainstem and spinal cord than a posterior instability. And then you come with CCI, so craniocervical instability. And so by definition, craniocervical instability would involve the cranium and the cervical spine. However, um, I think it's not a well-named entity. I think based off of the nomenclature, so this is the occiput or C0, and then this is the atlas or C1. So it should either be called occipital atlantal instability or atlanto occipital instability to properly use the nomenclature because cervical, it says cranium, but then cervical, you could, you could um, infer that that could be C C1 and C2, and even you know, anywhere down the line, um, as as a as a combination of factors. So craniocervical instability, technically, I believe the vast majority of of patients and physicians believe that that refers to C0 and C1, which it does. But I, like I said, more appropriately, you would want to name name it by the actual single bones that are involved, like atlantoaxial instability. You would want to call the, the C0 C1 occipital atlantal instability or atlanto occipital you can reverse it but the term craniocervical instability is really what people mean by that but it's it's more of a general term as opposed to a specific named uh entity thank you that's very does helpful. that make sense yeah that makes sense thank you um so can you speak about you spoke about the type of patients that you see can you speak about the spectrum of full instability versus partial instability and how you as a practitioner would assess them clinically to determine the level of instability, uh, the treatment plan perhaps, uh, and based on the symptomatology, 
as well as future imaging discussions, which we'll have. Sure, a partial instability, um, again, like I alluded to earlier, um, I would more likely deem that a uh, hypermobility because a partial instability would dictate that the, or instability, the word instability is, is much more of a pathologic term than hypermobility is. So anytime there's instability, it comes paired with neurological symptoms. And I guess one could classify it from, you know, mild, moderate, severe neurological compromise, but that I think is in the eye of the beholder, what dictates to be something to be mild, moderate, or severe, um, people would argue that, but I would say, you know, if you want to term partial instability, uh, not a severe instability, um, then we can do that. But I would I would term it more hypermobility. And once you get into, you know, naming something instability, you're dealing with neurological uh, symptoms that are impairing and debilitating for that patient. Um, as far as delineating whether somebody has that, there are multiple uh, orthopedic and neurologic tests that one can do clinically who doesn't have imaging or access to imaging to get a, a rough idea whether or not somebody has um, likely has uh, instability or hypermobility causing some of these excuse me some of these symptoms and I would say the most relevant test if a patient is for example on the table or sitting in the in the clinician's office and they're talking about lightheadedness dizziness pressure in their head blurry vision or something at that moment, there there would be something that it's called a sharp purser test that one would be able to perform very quickly and very effortlessly, which is basically a reductionary test. So if the patient is uh, experiencing these symptoms, you know how I mentioned that the joints don't stack perfectly, you could have just a slight slippage. And so if, if they're experiencing that at that moment in time, and it is mildly compressing their brainstem or irritating their brainstem, you can do this reductionary test, which will actually relocate so the vertebrae perfectly, the C1 and C2 vertebrae perfectly onto each other. And if you wait then 10 to 25 seconds, and there was a compression of their brainstem prior to you doing that test, within that 10 to 25 seconds, they will mention that their vision is cleared, that they, the pressure in their head is reduced or gone, and that they feel more alert. And then literally at the moment that you let go of that test, um, within 10 seconds or 15 seconds, they will, they will say that they're pressure in their head is returned and their eyes would blurry again. And so ultimately the test is holding somebody's forehead. So unfortunately this per this model doesn't have a forehead and, and pressing that towards the back. So from front to back, and then taking this C2 um, spine, spinous process and pushing it in the opposite direction. And like I said, what that does is it takes, you know, what potentially were slightly offset rings and it forces them to be perfectly aligned so that the opening there is maximized. And so what goes through that opening is the last part of the brainstem or the medulla, which houses the vagus nerve. And so by using this test, a reductionary test to try to realign uh, and open up that area there and seeing the results of that would be a great litmus test for anybody, any practitioner, um, but the patient has to have symptoms at that moment in time. So it's not a provocatory test to try to elicit dizziness or elicit something else. It's a reductionary test, which is intended to actually reduce or relieve the symptoms. This can be done seated or lying down. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, finally, I just want to ask you about the types of patients that you see in Langley and what is a good prospective patient? How would they be a good fit for you? Um, I would say the vast majority, like I said, do have a traumatic history. Um, I'm going to venture to say that the vast majority of the remainder um, display signs on their imaging of having sustained a whiplash trauma at some point in time in their life that they oftentimes don't recall. But the straightening of the cervical lordosis is a common finding that I find in, in most people's imaging and I would say I'd be hard pressed to think of a single case right now where I've had a patient who um, either came in purely under the guise of they have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or that they have MBCFS uh, or they have a post-viral or post-infectious uh, cause for the symptoms that they're having where their their cervical spine assuming they had a cervical spine x-ray done at some point in time does not show a straightening or a reversal of the cervical lordosis, which is indicative of whiplash trauma. Um, and, and like I said, and then the other cluster of patients that are the non-traumatic or, or don't recall trauma are the Ehlers-Danlos 
MECFS post viral um, uh, patient group. And so anybody experiencing, you know, dizziness, nausea, vertigo, uh, blurry vision, double vision, ringing in their ears, fullness in their ears, hoarseness in their voice, phlegm buildup, uh, sleep apnea, snoring, heart palpitations. Uh, diarrhea, constipation, increased urinary urgency without being hydrated, um, temperature control issues, uh, even reproductive issues like, you know, erectile dysfunction in, in men. Those are all clusters of symptoms that have presented that all, um, or not all, but that have been shown to have a likely connection to uh, the brainstem and uh, upper cervical instability. Thank you, Dr. Blaskovich, for this great talk today. I very much appreciate your time. There are a number of patient-led collaboratives that are trying to make a difference. So working with practitioners like yourself, specialists in this area who understand um, the symptomatology and also how it impacts people's lives and how to uh, better help them garner some advantages and, and progression in their life is just huge. So thanks for joining me today. It's my pleasure. You're welcome.